I'm Van Sebastian, here with my co-host, S.A. Baz Collins, for this week's Written on the Edge, Season 8, Episode 32, Friday Interview. We'll be getting to know Mike Albo better and talking about their novel, Another Dimension of Us. Welcome our guest. Mike Albo is the author of three novels and myriad magazine articles. He has written horoscopes, love advice, and was the critical shopper columnist for the New York Times. He also performs comedy shows, both solo and ensemble, has emceed for many galas and benefits, and is an interviewer in his own right. Mike, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. Oh, pleasure. So <laughs> that is quite the wheelhouse of creativity. Where did you get your start? Oh, God. Um... I, I've been freelance writing since I was about 25, and I think I got my start uh, writing, well, like the kids in my book, in, in Another Dimension of Us, um, mm -hmm. I, was, uh, I was really into poetry when I was a kid, and I started writing poetry for the literary magazine in high school, and I was all poetry all the time when I went to college and University of Virginia and studied poetry there. And then went to grad school for poetry, like a really smart financial move. And then, um, <laughs> and then realized that like I was interested in other types of writing, and started sort of expanding outward from there, and writing for magazines and anything that would print me. <laughs> so, nice. uh, yeah, it's been a long freelance road. I could, I could give much advice about freelance writing. Have you yet? TED Talk time. I know, right? Oh my god. <laughs> So we're here today to talk about Another Dimension of Us, the cover you just teased. Yes. Cover reveal, cover reveal. <laughs> what would you like people to know about it before we dig in? Um, well, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, it's been called a speculative romance. Um, and it's sort of science fiction, supernatural, young adult book about a group of queer 15 year olds um, who live from in the past and the future. Some of the characters live in 1986, other ones live in 2044, and they both find this mysterious book in the library about astral projection. Um, and if you don't know what astral projection is, it's this idea that you can leave your body and your 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 etheric form, your soul can travel in, into other dimensions. And so they learn how to do this and it upends their lives and they have to help each other and save each other in the astral plane. So Thursday for queers before we have the kiki. Okay, got it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> I don't know how this came out of me, but it did. It was like, um, I think it was, I'd been thinking about it for a long time. Um, and I started writing it during the pandemic. And it was really about, to, for me, um, when the pandemic was happening, I was thinking so much about the last time I had a, dealt with a pandemic and um, comparing and contrasting the 80s and the living through AIDS as a young teenager and then thinking about kids these days you know outside my window on, you know, on the street in New York I would see these teenagers who just would stop at nothing to hang out during a pandemic and just how how when you're young you will no matter what the fear is you want to live your life you'll defy you know? everything and so I started yeah and and uh so I started thinking about comparing and tra contrasting those two times and that kind of started the the germination process now, is it just two boys or is there a third sort of present? Uh, third present? Third, there's a, there's a third. two. Go ahead. Uh, there's there's a bunch of characters. There's um, two boys, like the two boys on the cover. Uh, this is Tommy and that's Ronaldo. That's sort of like the love object, the beautiful poet boy. That, and Tommy's in love with him, but won't say anything because it's the 80s, you know. And then in the future, and then they have a best friend character, uh, Dara, who is uh, kind of like a you know, latent lesbian and it's kind of like the the lesbian best friend that every gay guy needs in high school you know the tough the tough girl who tells it like it is mm -hmm. and um yeah we all we all need those those lesbians around um right. and then in the future there's a, a girl named pris who is also a lesbian um and her best friend is sort of a trans femme uh individual named jade and uh they're not in love and, and Pris is, I mean, Pris isn't in love with Jade, but Pris 
is has been her be Jade's best friend forever and feels Jade pulling apart and be because Jade's coming into their looks and becoming much more beautiful. And it's, I think I just was like that typical thing that happens when you're a kid and you're, you, your friends, your friends kind of like separate and you feel jealous and um, c conflicted about your friendships. So I've dealt with that too, with the, with the future characters. Wow. All right. So all I was asking was, was there a like, current modern perspective, but it sounds like it's just past and present. Oh. I see what you're saying. Um, that would be the real. No, it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's a there's the past eighty six. There's the future two thousand forty four, and then there's this sort of timeless era called on the astral plane. So, okay. which yeah. Okay, so the question I have is: it, Does Endora make an appearance on that plane? <laughs> she should have. I oh know, my right? Gosh. <laughs> um, right like <laughs> yeah I love Agnes Endora. Moorhead should be everywhere <laughs> <laughs> she really should the she, kids are all who the hell is Agnes Moorhead <laughs> she has a beautiful moment with Samantha like season three ish where she tells Samantha that she is a child of starlight and a daughter of the wind and it's very poetic in how she tells Samantha to not not hide who she is because she's married to somebody and that speech sounds like it would have fit in your book really well Wow, that's really beautiful. Yeah, See, Agnes Moorhead is God. <laughs> it's a it's a powerful moment that resonates through time because the way she said it was just heart. I I remembered all these years later. It's that heartwarming. Oh, that's so nice. I I love those little moments in those shows that, like, I always think about the Brady Bunch episode when um Imogen Coca plays the the ugly aunt, and mm -hmm. Jan looks like her. And then she comes and she's like so sad that she looks like her aunt, but then she finds out that Imogen Coca is just the coolest person in the world and has traveled everywhere and is like sexy and in this different way. And she learns how to not base her life on her looks. Yep. Those are the moments. Yep. So back to you. Isn't it weird moments. how queers we find those things and those are the things that get locked up in yeah. there? Yeah. 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 It's true. So how did you navigate all the perspectives in your book? Gosh, at some points I felt like I was a travel agent. I was just like, okay, Jade's there and Pris is there and Tommy's there. And uh, it was, and I don't work with an outline. I just sort of let it flow. Um, so it was a lot of cutting and pasting. Um, and there was definitely some some moments when I had to, you know, uh, okay, ronaldo has gone for three months. No, let's make it two months. Okay, they have to come back to school. Um, but then it, it, the other thing that I think is kind of interesting is, not knowing where I was going. I mean, I kind of knew where the end was going to be, but mm -hmm. not knowing where I was going, a lot of these surprises and spoilers in the book mm -hmm. happened um, that I didn't know were going to happen. And uh, so I kind of let it happen, I guess. That's that's what <laughs> so, makes pants writing very, very fun. Yes. Mm, See to your pants. Yep, totally. And and I, you know, I re I remember um remember the the, the new Battles Galactica that came out in the 2000s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm you know, sort of like a reboot of the show. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the best shows. And there was a, um, a, a podcast with the creator and he would talk about each episode and he talked about how they didn't know. They had these things, these little wild cards in the, in the plot and they had no idea for five seasons how they're going to end up where they were, but they did. Yeah. So I think it's yeah. important to keep things a little bit mysterious when you're writing. And I think you feel that from the storytellers, if even they have that element of, well, could it, you know, I mean, I think yeah. stranger things while they've planned those things out, I don't think they knew from the very beginning that Will was going to be queer. I think mm -hmm. that was an evolution and they mm -hmm. saw where the fans were going with it. And they just went, Oh, here's an organic moment. We can fold into the show. And then, Whoa, lo and behold, Noah snap. Okay. You know, so yeah, you just uh, yeah. serendipity of it all, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think, there's a detrimental side to it too, because the way that Lost ended up the show was oh, complete yeah. hairball. They got mess. lost. <laughs> they got lost. So there's this, that was a story this, about the writers getting lost. <laughs> yeah, totally. But I think there's this weird alchemy, this weird kind of positioning. You have to make sure you kind of know where you're going, but you kind of have to keep mystery going along at the same time. It's this, it's this little bit of a chemical reaction. You have to create the perfect situation for that. So I have a question for you that's a little off the wall, but it's the first thing that popped into my head. And 
and beds will tell you that's dangerous. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, when you're talking about these two time periods, and you know the gays, we love our pop culture references. How did you deal with it with the boys? Like if some, if the guy from 2044 goes, meant to mention something, the other one's like, who the hell is that? <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah that happens a lot. In that it. Out? Yeah, I actually, when, when Chris and Tommy finally meet in the astral plane, um, they have a lot of talk about this. And Chris is like, you know, says to Tommy, like, oh, well, you're queer. And Tommy's like, don't say that word. I'm not, you know, because Tommy's like living in a, a lie, living in mm -hmm. silence. And the word queer back in the 80s was not a word you used. It was a bully. Um, and, uh, and so they had this like kind of interesting discussion between the past and the future. Uh, and Tommy learns like, oh, it's okay to say I'm queer. And then he kind of comes out in the astral plane. And Chris sort of learns about the past and learns, you know, as much as it, she learns the, the hardships that I think uh, people before her might have experienced um, outside of their sexuality or inside their sexuality. And I think that's beautiful because, you know, I, I've always maintained that when people talk about words having power, I don't think they complete the sentence. Words have power, but only the power you give them. Mm -hmm. So if you claim something like queer, and then it's like, and so what? And what else you got? Yeah. You know, kind of thing. And there's that power because mm -hmm. they think they're using it from a place of power. And you just take that right back and go, and mm -hmm. yep. what else? You know, yeah. What's going on there? You know? Yeah. It was another sort of fun thing that was fun to write in the book is Jade's, uh, Jade's section. So, you know, these characters take each, take different chapters and mm. Jade has a couple of chapters theirself. And it was fun to use they, them pronouns and create a, a narrative using they, them um, as the pronouns. Uh, and it really changed the sentence structure. Um, and that was that was a really fun experience to, to try out. Nice. Oh. So bear with my nerdiness for a moment, but I know that the astral plane is sometimes connected to the Akashic record, which is sort of supposed to be the sum of human memory in, in an existential way. Did you tap into any of that with these characters? Yeah, they ha they have to to save um, to save the the two of them are lost in the astral plane okay. because of the scary demon, and the other characters have to go to the akashic records and and steal them away. So and to save their souls physically, they have to go to the li to this library and find the, the find their records to save them from the demon. Nice. Um, so is I, it a yeah, definitive? Is it a definitive end in the story? Or I mean, are, do, is there a potential for this world to grow because you have that ethereal element? To yeah, there is There is a potential. There, definitely Pris's story is is very open-ended, um, but uh, it does it has a pretty definitive end to my, my editor. I was like, maybe this could be a three-part series. I was kind of getting, you know, exploding my mind. <laughs> and my editor was like, why don't you just do, make an ending, you know? And I'm kind of glad I did because it's, uh, some people cry when I'm, and, and I know this sounds so gross, but like, I love hearing that people cry at the end of my book. <laughs> well, we've always said it's better to get a real strong emotion yeah. than meh. If you get meh, yeah. you can't do anything with it. But if you get a real yeah. strong emotion, either way, you know, you've hit them, you know, and yeah. that's what every, every storyteller is after. Totally. And, and it was really, it was very interesting to do um, research on the astral plane. Um, and I want to point out this book, uh, The Art and Practice of Astral Projection. Um, okay. I got this book at a used bookstore in LA in 1998. And it's the former owner It was obsessed with this book. And there's all these, you know, scribbles and, scr you know, underlines. And I've held on to it forever <laughs> thinking, what well, I want to do something with this book. And then I started thinking about, oh, what if someone found this book and learned how to uh, okay, so did project. you look in the front to see if it said not property of the half blood prince? Because it definitely <laughs> has elements of that. <laughs> it's it's funny. It's um it's written by this man named Ophiel, and it's still in print. Um I have a couple different copies of it. And uh he died in the 80s. Um, and so there's this little editor's note that said, you know, in the in the book, he's like, come meet me in the astral plane. And then the, there's this, you know, or write to me, and there's an editor's note that said, you know he's no longer with us and you can't really write him or can you, you know, like, <laughs> nice. but it, <laughs> I yeah. just love and the fact so, that the two of you, the two of you are geeking out on all this and all I'm worried about. Did Endora make an appearance? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that you guys are geeking out on this. <laughs> it's 
all one big holistic pie, Baz. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, I'll be over like, here with there, Agnes. <laughs> is there anything else you want folks to know either about the book or your other works? Um, yeah, well, this is the first, this is the first um science fiction related book that I have written. And my other two books were more autobiographical and humorous. Um but I wrote a science fiction novel that I, I just need to say this out loud because I'm waiting for it to be published somewhere. And it's with my agent. My agent's been sending it out and I'm trying to find an editor for it. But it's a science fiction story about a girl looking for love in kind of a metaverse um, world. Uh, and and then, yeah, the, and and uh, I'm working on some, um, some, other, some other stuff, too. It's, nice. I'm always now I think this this book, now that it's out, it kind of like helped me really kickstart um the process a little bit very cool <laughs> so do you have any appearances or book fairs you're going to i mean what's coming up next for you yeah um i am reading i just read this week in provincetown at the p-town bookshop which just reopened uh and i'm reading in martha's vineyard on monday next week uh what is that date july 24th at Bunch of Grapes Bookstore in Vineyard Haven at 7 p.m. And then I'm going to be reading in Fire Island uh, at a friend's apartment, a friend's terrace. And um, and then I'm doing, and then I'm coming back here to Provincetown for the book festival at the end of September. Nice. Yeah. All right. Is there a social media presence where you're most active where people can reach out to you? Yeah, uh, I'm very Instagrammy. Um, and my Instagram is at Albo Mike. Um, I'm also on Twitter, but I don't really look at Twitter too much. But Instagram, <laughs> nobody does. <laughs> is, yeah, Instagram's <laughs> the place to to find me. But you can also um, get in touch with me through my website, MikeAlbo.net. Perfect. Any final words of wisdom? Um, just have a great summer and be nice to yourself. And um, will it and be gay? <laughs> I guess there you go. I like there that. you go. I like that. <laughs> All right, folks, we'd like to extend a huge thank you to Mike Elbow for being with us. Mike, thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Our pleasure. We at Written on the Edge are proud to introduce you to new media by queer content creators. So if you enjoy learning about new artists or hearing our thoughts on entertainment media, please like and subscribe so you get the alerts for new episodes. The show was produced by Rogue Ravens Media. For our disclaimers, links to social media, our listen stations, or to sign up as a guest, visit www.ropepodcast.com. Tune in next week for your queer media fix. Closing time. The bums rush and melody, dear. <laughs> <laughs>